I'll now start to welcome everyone. I can see people are trickling into our cyberspace room. My name is Catherine Dupoulou-Menager and I'm the Artistic Director of Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival. This is our first time of going online and international. It's been uh, an interesting year to say the least. We would normally in September be meeting face to face in Sydney, but uh, we're discovering an entirely new way to reach out to the people in Australia and we hope in the rest of the world who love um, crime. And it's fantastic to have our first uh, US guest in um, this in this uh, this event. Hi, Karen. And you know, the woman with the best name for a crime novelist, of course, Karen Slaughter. I think you get the prize for that. But I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of country throughout Australia. We recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So now to our second festival event. And it's a fantastic pleasure to welcome Karen. Uh, we've been chatting behind the uh, scenes and I'm looking forward very much to what should be a lively and fun event. Um, it's the morning for us, but it's the evening for her. So thank you for giving us part of your evening. Our interviewer today is well-known Australian journalist, Caroline Overington, journalist and of course a writer yourself and friends of Bad Sydney will have seen you, Caroline, being interviewed and interviewing. Just to quickly let you know how we'll be running this event. Um, your sound and video audience have been muted. Caroline will talk for, will interview Karen for about 45 minutes, 50 minutes. About 40 minutes in, she will remind you that you can start sending your questions in using the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screens. And she'll try and get and ask as many as she can, but she may run out of time because there are bound to be loads. I'll come back very much at the end just to say thank you to our speakers and goodbye. And now I'll hand over to you, Caroline. Well, hello everybody and welcome. Welcome to the Bad Crime Writers Festival in Sydney, online for the first time, which is exciting for me. Um, we're here with Karen Slaughter, published in 37 languages and more than 35 million books sold. So a true global international sensation. Um, the author of 20 novels, a native of Georgia and currently living in Atlanta. We're here to talk about her new book, The Silent Wife. I don't know if you approve of this, Karen, all the folding over of the pages. Are you okay with that? Or, no, that's... Not, not for my book. I do it to other people's books, but no. <laughs> it's just... It's actually just you, you, Caroline. Only you are not allowed to do that. <laughs> Anyone else can. Well, it's an absolutely cracking read. Um, but also, I'm thrilled just to be here with you because we are, you are, as we know, a top chick and a bonza sheila. And I'm allowed to say that because one of the things that Karen did during the pandemic, or may still be doing during the pandemic, was unable to travel to all the countries you normally visit. You started doing our Zoom conversations with authors from around the world saying you wish you could visit their country, but when you do, what kind of language will I need to know? Um, and we did one together and I tried to teach you some of the things that we say in Australia, like yep. Sheila, for example. Yep. <laughs> gonna get, gonna, gonna, a, a root in the dunny, which is, uh, I believe, one of your finer meals that you have there. Not, not even close. <laughs> not even close. <laughs> now, it's good to have you back to talk about um, The Silent Wife. Now, I think that most of your fans will know that the books began with the, with the Grant County series and then the Will Trent series came along and Sarah does the crossover between the two and then sort of the rest is history. If you haven't read the two series, I highly recommend them, but you can also read them as individual standalone books. You can pick up this one having not read any of the others and it stands alone. Um, this one begins with a young woman very upset in her room or with her roommates. Um, she heads out on a run and, and I, I think we can say she's murdered, right? We're not going to give anything away. Um, but it's pretty brutal in, in its detail from the very early pages. Um, and I wanted to ask you about that, your, the decisions you make about how much to include. Well, you know, honestly, I think it's always interesting when people talk about the violence in my books, because especially with the scene you're talking about, 
what you find out happened is after the fact. It's not really in the moment that you get the details of everything uh, that was done. And, you know, in throughout this book, that's how information is relayed as if it's, it, you know, it, you, you have a hint of something and then it's relayed after the fact. And that was very deliberate on my part because I knew I was talking about really tough stuff. So I wanted to make sure I gave people breathing room because I think if I talked about it happening as it was happening, that it would be a bit too much for the reader. So this is actually a, a book where I felt like I, I should be praised for my restraint because I could have scared the hell out of a lot more people than I actually ended up doing. Now, I mean, one of the issues that sometimes comes up in your books is the idea that um, there are predators all around us. Now, the crime statistics don't necessarily bear that out. We are, in fact, safer as women than we've ever been. Um, tell me about your decision to sort of um, to, to, to write a series of books where there is that predator um, mentality going on. What, what's behind that idea? Well, I mean, when you talk about statistics, you have to say, okay, well, what statistically are you talking about? Less sexual harassment? a lower level of uh, domestic violence, that's not necessarily the case. And, and you know, honestly, as you know, because you've, you've d done deep dives into these subjects, they're not often honestly reported. And oftentimes there's a backlash when you have something like Me Too, where women say, okay, well, I was, I was raped, but I'm not like those women, so I sh don't have a right to uh, to report this or, you know, there are all these sorts of barriers to reporting the crime of sexual assault that no other crime really has. I mean, you, you wouldn't have come home and your husband has been murdered and the police say, you know, we can, we can do an investigation, but it's going to be really tough on you to find out, you know, maybe the person who killed him was a friend of yours. It's going to be really difficult. Are you sure you want us to investigate? I, that never happens but it does happen constantly all over the world when it's rape. And so, you know, I, the, the, the statistics I think can be a bit misleading. In, in the United States, every year, a quarter of a million women over the age of 18 reports sexual assault. That hasn't changed that much in the last few decades. The fact that for women from the age of 18 uh, to 45, if you look at the leading causes of death, homicide is always going to be in the top five. If you're an mm -hmm. infant, it's like one of the main causes of death, right? So it, it, it is something that we don't often talk about. And a lot of times it's misclassified when a woman is, is a victim of violence. I mean, you look at incels, for instance, those crimes aren't classified as, as crimes against women. They're just murders. But you take into account what the thought of the murderer was, which is that all women should worship me and they deserve to be murdered if they don't. You know, that, that mentality is still there. And it goes hand in hand with the white su supremacist mentality that we're seeing such a, a huge flowering of across not just the United States, but the world. You know, I've never met a white supremacist who's like, yeah, we should celebrate white women too. You know, it's, it's all about the patriarchy. So that, those are things that I like to write about when I write my stories, and, and this one specifically. You know, you have a person who is a, the perpetrator who has such a deep-seated hatred for women and is, and is really pushed by that hatred to do horrible things. And that's what I want to talk about in my writing. Whenever I write about violence against women, the focus is always on, you know, I don't believe someone does something because they're evil. I mean, that's just a really convenient excuse. They do stuff for reasons and they're not controlled by an outside force. Uh, and I want to know what that reason is, even if it's just as simple as, well, you know, this girl wouldn't screw me in high school. You know, that for some men is something that compels them to murder later in life. Yeah. Now, you mentioned then that there are an, a lot of men, and you mentioned in, incels, which is not such a big movement here in Australia, but we do understand what it is. Um, that's sort of the men who claim that they are an involuntary celibate, meaning that they are not able to attract women, um, they're not able to get women to marry them, they're not able to have, have 
women have sex with them because women have just um, become too powerful um, and too arrogant in a way. And you mentioned as well the idea that a lot of men have a deep-seated hatred of women, when in fact it should be the other way around. <laughs> right. Should, women would understandably have a deep-seated hatred of the patriarchy, I think, but it doesn't play out in the same way in terms of violent acts. What, what, do, you, what do you say about that? Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. And I think that women, whether through conditioning or whatever, just aren't encouraged to fight back physically. You know, if, if you look at on a, a playground situation where two boys disagree, they just hit each other. And with two girls, if they disagree, then they might say really nasty things about each other and spread rumors, you know. So, but I, I will say if the girls are going to fight, get out of the way because they will want to kill each other. You know, boys want the fight broken up. Any school teacher will tell you, boys, if they're in a fight, they, they know they can really hurt each other and they want you to stop them. But girls want you out of the way because they will commit murder. Um, but, you know, men are stronger than we are. And there's, especially in the United States, you know, we're a very puritanical society here. Uh, we, we still have this idea that we should and, and most nations have this. I mean, honestly, in the 1970s, how many women were going to bars in Australia? But there's this idea that women are either or, you know, either they're the good women or they're the bad women. And there is a lot of social pressure for women to self-correct for that, you know, and ostracize a woman who's a bad woman or, you know, celebrate a woman who's a good woman. And I think a lot of that's changing. I mean, I was, I was one of the people who uh, was very excited when I watched the video for WAP because I was like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> finally, we've been listening to guys talk about their dicks being hard for years. I mean, it was great to finally see women celebrating that. And the backlash, it was interesting because the people who were very upset about it were drowned out by the people who thought it was hilarious and fun. And I yeah, thought, yeah. wow, that is such a change from when I was, but like, we're about the same age and you couldn't imagine that. I mean, people wanted to, to put Madonna in prison for Papa Don't Preach, right? For the Catholicism and the icono iconography. And now here we are at this. I mean, the world has changed so fast. I think it's incredible. And I, I think it, women taking power and showing power. And I mean, Cardi B is a millionaire. Uh, she's a very successful, self-employed businesswoman, and she is going to be a bazillionaire soon with all the, the product endorsements she's doing. She's very clever, and she's using that to monetize in a way that men have been doing for years and sort of saying, you know, screw you, and I think it's fantastic. Well, that, that's an interesting point, isn't it? Certainly in the 1970s. I think with Madonna, too, the idea of the, uh, the teenage pregnancy that was behind Papa don't preach the idea that she'd had sex without being married. I mean, that's almost un unimaginable that you would get a backlash for that today. It's changed so fast. But there is still, I think, the idea that if you have a bit of a, an interesting sexual history and then something violent happens to you, maybe you asked for it. Maybe you right. deserved it. Well, you when, know, I mean, when will that disappear? In the United States, we, are, we have you know, as far as reproductive freedom, that's very re restricted here. And women's reproductive rights is uh, heavily policed. That's still something that's going on. And, you know, that you'll find people who are very adamantly against abortion unless it's rape or incest, right? And then they're like, oh, that's okay. And what they're saying is if, if the woman did not enjoy the sex act, then it's okay. But if she did, then we're gonna force her to carry this. Right. And, and it's it's really, I think, says a lot about where we were in the world, but also where we're going to, because we're, I feel like we're reaching this inflection point where women, ha women, minorities, you know, name it, are just saying, I'm sick of this. I don't want you to make me play by rules that you're not playing by. Right. And we're seeing this in the, a lot in the lockdown where we're saying, well, why am I? Why do I have to wear a mask when these idiots are going to a concert and they're not wearing a mask? You know, wh where's the social contract, right? Where's the 
you know, you, just basic decency of being a human being in the world. And, and I think that we're going to get back to that, but we're heading for a correction. And, you know, maybe the best thing that ever happened to us, believe it or not, might be Donald Trump amplifying all the things that are wrong with society. So we can say, oh yeah, that's, those are the things we need to fix. One of the other things that's often wrong with society, and, and I think a theme that has run from time to time through your books, is the idea that sometimes the police don't get it right. They sometimes have the wrong guy. And it's very difficult to correct these mistakes. I think particularly in the United States, we've seen a number of cases where uh, somebody has been wrongfully convicted and it's taken a very long time for justice to be done or corrected, if you, if you will. Is that a, a particular area of interest for you, Karen? It is. And I mean, I know you wrote a book about that child uh, murder case. So it's something that you're interested in as well as, you know, we, we both have an understanding of how the system works, but I think also how it doesn't work in some cases and can fail catastrophically. I personally, I know a lot of police officers. I talk to a lot of agents with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. And I, I don't, I've never met a police officer who isn't disgusted when they see those videos of these unarmed uh, black men being shot or whatever, you know, suffocated, you name it, or what happened with Breonna Taylor. And, you know, part of the problem is, it's, it's the same thing we see in American med medicine, because doctors can't say, I made a mistake and I apologize, because they'll get sued and they'll never be a doctor again. And with the police departments, I think they feel like they can't say that they made a mistake. And that's really dangerous because you, you know, it's like on a personal level, I think character comes from making mistakes and learning why you made them and not making them again. And these forces are not gonna learn how to improve if they don't look at their mistakes and say, why did this happen? Why does this keep happening? What can we do to stop it? which is so strange to me because, you know, policing is all about statistics. And it kind of locks into what you were saying earlier about why don't women hate men the way incels hate women. Because statistically, I should be more afraid of the typical profile of a mass shooter or a school shooter, which is a young white man with a lot of guns or a white supremacist, you know, young white men with guns. That should be what I'm worried about, not a black guy walking down the street in the hoodie because they're far more likely to commit violence against me. And also violence tends to be very segregated. Black people kill black people, white people kill white people. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a very strange thing to me that police departments don't look at those statistics and say, you know, what can we do? Instead, they, they look at statistics and say, okay, this is a, a low finance area, this is a, a, an impoverished area, this is where more crime is likely to be committed. So we're gonna heavily police that and try to stop the crime, right? And they end up playing leapfrog. So, you know, that, that's the thing I worry about most is that it's just this inability to admit mistakes and it's causing an erosion in trust. And without trust in our military and police, we don't have a democracy. Mm. And what do you think about the idea that's often um, put forward in Australia that more diversity will help, that if you have uh, more women in the police force, for example, if you have more minorities in the police force, this will assist the police not only to think about crime in a different way, but also perhaps reduce some of the mistakes that are made by police forces around the world? It absolutely, we have all kinds of data that proves it does. I have a, a dissertation, actually, I have it right here. <laughs> This woman, she's a, she's a, she lives in Australia now, but this is her dissertation on women police officers, the, the introduction in the 1970s, because you know, we were at this inflection point where the, the United States government actually did something good. They said exactly what you said, we need more police, we need more communities of color represented in the police force. And how we're gonna bring that about is we're gonna bribe these cities to do it. We're gonna give them money and say, you know, we'll give you a million dollars if you hire 10% more women and or 10% more minorities. And what they found out was that the, the women started on their own de-escalating situations. You know, women are not as strong as men. 
uh, which is, you know, it's just basic science. But I've, I've seen police officers take down a, a, a football player with a baton, you know, it's not, it's, but if you have a guy roll up onto a scene and there's a lot of testosterone, he's usually going to meet force with force. Mm -hmm. Women will just, it, it was really strange. I mean, it t it's talked about in this it's dissertation saying women would just say, hey, what's wrong? What's bothering you? And listen to them, um, make them feel validated, get them in the back of the squad car. And it's the same result. You want to arrest this guy, you want to take him out of this situation. You don't have to beat the crap out of him to make that happen. And it, in police forces, I think that women in policing make up about 17% uh, countrywide of police officers. They're responsible for less than 3% of the lawsuits that are filed for misuse of force. Uh, and these lawsuits cost our country billions of dollars, billions of dollars. And you know, part of me thinks we should take those billions of dollars from these lawsuits and say, here are some money, please hire some black guys, hire some you know, Hispanic women, hire some, you know, make the force more diverse. But then we have the problem of, okay, well, if you're a, a young black man, why would you want to be a cop? If this is what you, the way you think you'll be treated there. So it needs to be like an overwhelming, like, like if everybody who's been at these protests, which, you know, 98% have been extremely pe peaceful protests, which is our guaranteed our right to do that. If half of those people went into the police academy, they could change everything overnight. So, you know, it would really make a change. There's always a sense, isn't there, of wanting to change things from within and then the reality of your experience when you get there. I, I do, I want to talk about this, this book too, because it, it contains so many of those themes. But there's also beautiful relationships in it. Now, I, I don't want to give too much away, but I was delighted to find Jeffrey in here. Your, your readers will, will know exactly who he is. Um, and there's also the relationship between Sarah and Will. And I love that scene where, you know, she, she puts both hands on his shoulders and kind of looks him in the eye. And, and you know that she always has to do everything with him, right? And here's another sort of example. But then also to, to revisit the time with Jeffrey. Um, and I, I won't say more than that for readers who don't kind of know the history, but do you find that uh, your readers give you feedback about wanting to hear from these characters again, wanting their relationships develop as well as reading a good thriller? Yeah, I do. And, you know, I always say I'm, I'm writing love stories where re people die really horribly brutal ways. Um, and I love those relationships because I think they're important. And, and you know this as an author, you have to have ba balance. You can't just have unrelenting darkness. You have to have some moments of lightness. You have to have people who love each other. You know, I, I even, like I thought, I just need to say this in a novel. And many books ago, I had Amanda and Faith having a conversation and Amanda saying to Faith, you know, you, you need to remind yourself every day that there are good men out there because you only see the bad men and it will make yeah. you hate men, you know? And, and that's something that a lot of female police officers say. And, you know, going back to uh, the racial component, you know, where if you're a cop and you're in a 90% African-American area and you're white, of course you're gonna see more black people committing crimes because it's 90%, right? In the same way that 90% white, you would see more white people committing crimes. but you know, I, I really just, I think it's important to have those relationships that feel solid. And I think, you know, I, I don't know that my male counterparts are, are conscious of this. I think they get a, a free pass on it, but I'm conscious as a woman writing about men doing bad things that there might be a tendency for people to say, well, she hates all men. And it's not true. I only hate men who hurt women, women you know, and the asshole at my grocery store, but that's a different story. Um, so I, I, Will's a good guy. Jeffrey's a good guy. You know, Je they're both police officers. They want to do the right thing, but they sometimes make mistakes. I mean, this is the genesis of this entire book is, you know, what if a cop who you root for, who's the, clearly the good guy, and he's put some bad guy behind bars and he's taken a, some shortcuts to get that to happen that aren't necessarily legal. Well, what if those shortcuts 
you know, that you thought were justified because they got the right result? What if they got the wrong result? What if he got the wrong guy? What if people are still being hurt by the real killer? Uh, and that's what I wanted to really explore. But I think you need the relationships in order to do that, because those are really big themes, especially now. It resonates through no fault of my own, you know. But I wanted to write a story where you had an understanding that these people could question each other, but still love each other. And the good guys could occasionally be wrong, but still be good guys. Well, because they're human. And, and one other thing about the book, mine um, has a dear reader at the back, and I don't think it's for me personally. I think it's for everyone who's reading. And it begins by saying that there's a big, gigantic warning, um, that there's spoilers if you go on to read it. And, it, and if you do go on to read The Dear Reader, you, the story will be completely ruined for you. So don't, don't do it. So we won't do that. But it is a letter of thanks to your readers. And you say that it's been 19 years now since you published Blindsided, the first. Um, do you, are you aware of having carried readers with you from the first to the very last book, that you have some who drop in and out and others who are, are with you for the whole journey? I am. And, you know, part of that is through my touring. Um, you know, I've been to Australia four or five times over the years. And, you know, I've remembered people that I saw on my first tour uh, who now, you know, have families or they're, they told me, oh, I read your book and it made me think it's okay for a woman to be interested in forensic science. And I went to college and, you know, or, or they said, I'm going to go to college. And then I see them four years later and they have a degree and they're working in the forensic field. Um, so I'm, I'm aware of them. I I'm so pr appreciative for, of them and grateful, but I never think about them when I'm writing a book. Uh, cause I just, I can't take notes from everybody. You know, it has to be my story and I have a vision of what I want to do. Um, but once I write it, I'm really eager for it to get out there and hopefully people will enjoy it and they like what the characters are doing and they're a little afraid and maybe it makes them think a little bit. So, you know, that, that's what I, I look forward to when I finish a book. I think, you know, what's, what are the, the women in, uh, outside of Amsterdam who come see me every year? What, what are they going to think about this? I hope that they're pleased. And I guess one of the other things about writing books over a period of two decades is the, the technological changes and the societal changes we've talked about. But I mean, there was no Facebook when you started. There was no Google. There were no iPhones. There was no, I mean, there's still crime. But has it become far easier to solve and therefore harder to write about because you have more CCTV, for example? Um, you have uh, victims able to reach for their phones, although we know that that doesn't always help. There was a case in Melbourne just two years ago where a girl um, walking home after doing a stand-up event at a comedy night was attacked from behind and she was actually on her phone at the time. So the, the technology did not save her life, um, which I thought was fascinating because people have assumed a sense of safety about the fact that you're very often not out of reach anymore. Mm -hmm. um, has it made it more difficult for you, Karen, writing to have to avoid cameras, phones, obvious clues? Well, I mean, you're absolutely right, because they had Yahoo when I was uh, <laughs> first started out. And, uh, I, you know, there were fax machines. Because I, I actually thought about updating Blindsided because like even the cars, they don't make those cars anymore, those car models that they drove. And I just thought, no, I don't need to mess with that. It would just take too much from the story. Um, but absolutely, I have to be aware of that. But, you know, fortunately for me, I don't write about typical criminals because they're very stupid and they will film themselves on Facebook. And police, that you know, a lot of the police divisions have internet crime services where they just, you know, they get a name from the field and they look on Facebook and said, yeah, he filmed himself robbing the convenience store. Here, here it is, you know, yeah. or they'll brag on Facebook or Twitter or, you know, the thing is a lot of crimes. And I, I think that you've investigated bikies. Is that correct? You've written a story. Was that right? Was, I and, have indeed. Yes, I have for the newspaper. Right. So, you know, there's this cone, cone of silence that bad guys have. But, you know, they still tweet about it. They still, yeah. yeah. So it's totally different because they, I, I guess the internet gives them this sense that they're anonymous, but they're really not. And, you know, and they're posting their crimes online. Um, and you, so, because I, I mentioned bikies in particular, because we just had this 
bunch of idiots who uh, were selling meth and they were filming themselves selling meth. And the, G the Georgia Bureau of Investigation was like, dude, you know, we, we have the internet too. We see this. Uh, or, you know, the technology, the only thing is, so my crimes don't rely on that in general. You know, like Jeff Deaver, he, like Lincoln Rhyme has all this fancy equipment and he can find a, a pubic hair on a windowsill and in five minutes they've got the guy's home address, right? Yeah. And none of my stuff happens that way. It's always talking to people, putting clues together, figuring things out, which is honestly how most crimes are still solved, right? The oh, more difficult crimes. Yeah. 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 Now, also in your readers' note at the back of the book, you say that you purposely didn't mention the name of the person who murdered people in the National Forest in three states. Mm -hmm. It's not a crime with which I was familiar, I am now, but maybe you could perhaps tell us what that, what that series of crimes was and why you chose not to mention the name of the perpetrator. Well, mainly I didn't want to glorify him. I mean, he was just an awful human being, and I don't think his name bears repeating. I think that his victims' names are far more important. Um, but he was a serial killer uh, hunting people on the Appalachian Trail. So that, you know, Georgia is at the very beginning of the trail. It goes all the way up the Northeast, but most of his crimes were uh, below the, um, the, um, the Southern line. Uh, and the, the reason I mentioned that case was because the state of Georgia did something I thought was really a very good law. Uh, you know, and a lot of times we have really bad laws. So I think they should be rewarded for having a good law because the news, this was a very big story here and the newspapers sued to get the autopsy and the crime scene photographs to publish. And, you know, I think to me, while I strongly support freedom of the press, I'm a very big advocate for that. These are real people. They have families and they're just some things that you should not be able to see in a newspaper or on a news program. And because it, it doesn't add to the story, it felt very inflammatory for them to be asking for these photographs. And, you know, I think there should definitely be a, a time period in which you can't do that, you know, after a certain amount of time, maybe they should have access. But when it's in the moment and it's really raw, you, you have police reports, you can interview, you know, the police, the agents, everybody on it. You can in, even interview the killer if you want. But these photos, I think, are very private and shouldn't be out there. And I was aware as I was writing this book that people might make a connection to this particular killer. And I just wanted to make sure that I honored the story of the victims rather than bringing attention to him. And so when you mention um, that you, you offer your support for Georgia House Bill 1322, does that refer to the legislation that prevents the yes. publication of crime scene photos? Yeah, absolutely. How do you feel about that as a reporter? I mean, you've been on both sides. I mean, the book you wrote about that poor little kid, I mean, you would never want that to publish. To produce, um, I don't think you should reproduce autopsy photos or crime scene photos, no. And I understand there's a historical element too, but I wouldn't even be in favour of it. I mean, I've seen photographs on the internet, I'm sure we all have, of, for example, John F. Kennedy after he was right. shot. Um, right. That kind of thing I find uh, very disturbing. But I also, I'm also aware that we see far, far worse, um, far, far worse is available on the internet than a, than a mainstream sure. newspaper would ever publish. But I don't know about you, but like the first time I looked at a crime scene photo or the first time I saw an autopsy, it didn't feel real because these were things I had seen so much on television and in film that that to me was real and this other stuff that was actually the real stuff felt fake in a way if that makes sense. So it was, it was hard for my brain to say, wait a minute, this is an actual, this is actually what a dead body looks like, not what you see on television. Mm -hmm. And also I think I was surprised by how absent uh, the person is from their body. And I found yeah. that very comforting, that when you see a dead body, even if it's somebody you know and loved, they are gone. They are absolutely gone. They're, they are yeah. not there. I don't know if it's a soul or a spirit or what it is, but mm -hmm. for sure they are not there. And I found that very, very comforting. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the things that, one of the many traumas that we'll process 
post COVID is the loss of that sense of closure from seeing your loved one and, you know, who's, who's passed away and being able to be at the funeral or to, to see, you know, the body, if that's what you want to see. Uh, are you worried about um, trauma and inherited trauma from the pandemic that we're living in, not only in terms of lives lost in Australia, I think 500 lives lost in the US where you are many hundreds of thousands, but also the trauma that has been visited on people by, for example, enforced quarantine, um, inability to hold and be with loved ones, um, uh, curtailment of employment, poverty. Are you concerned? I am. And, you know, maybe you've, you've know this from some of your stories that you've researched about trauma in children, but children who are traumatized as adults, they are more likely to have addiction issues. Their life expectancy is shorter. They're more likely to have heart disease. Uh, there's just a host of physical manifestations of this trauma that you see. So I wonder about these kids, you know, and, and some of them being raised by really angry day drinkers at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and, and what it's going to be like for them when they're adults and if there's going to be, if, if their lives are going to be truncated because of this. I mean, we, we know even that very young people who get this disease, you know, in 15, 20 years, they might have COVID lung. Uh, they might, we might need more transplants. We, I mean, there's just a host of physical and psychological things that we can't comprehend at the moment. But you know, if one of the most useful things is to look at history because not a lot of people know that the Spanish flu, the pandemic in 1917, 18, which killed millions of people, those, that had lasting effect. Catherine Ann Porter, the author, she had it. Her hair, she was 26, her hair turned completely white from the stress in her body of fighting it off. And she had um, lung issues for her entire life because of it. Um, so what is that gonna be like in 10, 15, 20 years? I mean, you'll, you'll be damn happy you have universal health care. I don't know what we'll be doing in America, probably telling them to go to Australia. Well, I imagine that there will be flow on effects too from things that you touched on there. So the generation of children that we will lose from school, for example, who will never go back because they were already vulnerable before. Yeah. And yeah. having spent a year trying to share an internet connection with three or four siblings in an overcrowded house without, um, without a devoted parent to, to guide the homeschooling and who then fall by the wayside. I wonder if we will see in five to 10 years more crime because we know that those ch that the children who, do, who grew up to do best are the ones who stay at school and have stable relationships and have good role models are less yeah. likely to fall time. So I, I am wondering what, 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 well, what, I mean, it's very fortunate if you're a parent who can, you know, who doesn't have to work out of the home in this situation too. But I worry on the other side, because you're going to get bubbles of extremely privileged children uh, who perhaps have too much resources, too much attention, too much opportunity handed to them, as opposed to these other, their peers who are less fortunate. What horrible crimes are they going to commit? I mean, we've already had the worst uh, banking crisis in our lifetime, uh, where, you know, with derivatives and all that during the Bush years, destroying the world economy. What's going to happen to those kids who think they're, that because they have all this privilege and all this attention and they have such a demonstrably better life, who convince themselves that means they're better human beings and they have a right to do whatever they want to do? I mean, that, that's also a worry to think about. Yes, and also, I mean, we're talking to you here in Australia on September 11, so it's 20 years now since the attacks on the World Trade Center. And I remember thinking at the time that nothing would change the world quite like that did. But in fact, this has. This has. Yes, it's a similar thing that people who are as young as we were then are dealing with something or as traumatic, I think. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I have to ask. I'm going to ask for questions from our audience, which will come to me via Zoom and I'll read them out. So if I'm looking a little distracted, it's because I'm reading. But while I do go and go in search of those questions, please, anybody who has anything they'd like to ask Karen, I know she's happy to answer. Um, one of the things that amazes me about your, your process and, and your, well, your end result, actually, um, Karen, is the slow burn, the long, slow burn that is in all of your novels. Um, I'm wondering if you, if you know in the beginning what the clues are going to be, for example, a hair clip in here plays its role. Um, 
do you, or do you go back and drop them in afterwards when you realize that I need to point to a way? Is it how plotted are you? Well, I mean, th th here we say, are you a pantser or are you a plotter? In your seat of your pants? I'm sure that's something you have there too. Um, but I'm a little bit of both because I do, I, I've, I've told you this before, I, I always have to know who the bad person is in it, so that I can frame the book around that and, and do what I can to hide them in plain sight. And to me, that's really important because I like to play fair with my readers. I want to make sure that the really clever one who figures it out, you know, well before the time they're supposed to is interested enough to keep reading. But the person who's like me, I never figure anything out when I'm reading. I just sit back and want to be entertained. You know, if I figure it out, uh, you, you've done a really bad job that I've been <laughs> able to see it. But I want to make sure that when that person gets to the end of the book, instead of saying, what the hell just happened? They say, oh yeah, I remember these clues. I remember this, I remember that, you know? And I, that's what I love about a really well plotted crime novel. You know, Denise Mina does it. Um, I love uh, Mo Hader. Mike Connolly can do that kind of thing depending on what series he's doing. That, but that's like the real joy I think of reading a crime novel is feeling like you are solving it alongside the detective. So I absolutely, I have to know you know, this is the bad person. I also have bad women, but I never get credit for that. I mean, I've had some really <laughs> sadistic, awful women. And I, I don't just kill women. I kill a lot of men, but no one seems to care about that. Um, but the clues also, you know, I think ahead of time so that I can plant them. And sometimes I have to go back and make it blended in a little better. Or I'll think, ah, no, it can't be a pencil or a, it has to be a hair clip, you know? So I'll, so I'll have to go back in and make sure it all lines up. It all lines up. Now, Karen, we've got questions absolutely flooding in here. So I'm gonna have to go to some of them. Ruth asked, and by the way, I'm instructed um, for those who are watching to please use the Q&A and not the chat function. Um, Ruth says, are you planning any more standalone novels? Like for, I'm thinking Pretty Girl or something like that. Yeah, I'm actually, so I did Pretty Girls, Cop Town, and The Good Daughter, and now I'm working on my next one for next year, and it's a standalone also. And I really like doing them because it kind of gives me an opportunity to flex my storytelling muscle in a, a different way, because um, the stakes can be higher, because, I mean, you should never be really 100% certain that Will and Sarah and Faith are completely safe, um, considering my, what I've done to characters in the past. But, you know, I love writing about them. I want to keep writing about them. So I'm not going to have anything catastrophic happen to them. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, this story that I thought of for this next book was something where, you know, I needed that open-ended catastrophe question there. And so I thought this has to be a standalone. Well, actually, one of the other questions that you, you're being asked about your next book here by Louisa, she says, are you setting your, are you necessarily going to have to set it in the post-COVID world or will you choose to ignore the pandemic in your books? So, for example, the kinds of things that, that, that happen in books in the past would not be able to happen now, for example. You couldn't go to an airport as easily or, yeah. or jump in a taxi or have a meet somebody for coffee or... yeah. Yeah, you know, um, that was something I really thought about. And I talked to other friends of mine who are writers and some of them are ignoring it and some of them are like jumping into it. Um, I wanna talk about it because I don't think that we're gonna have a magic bullet anytime soon. But I do think that eventually we'll get some sort of test that we can administer at home. And if it's positive, we, we stay home. And if it's not, we can go out. And, you know, I just think once we, we embrace testing in a logical way and we create a test that's a home test that, that the world will change considerably, you know, and I don't know, Caroline, mm -hmm. if you've, you've, you've been tracking this, but our prison systems are COVID hotbeds. Between nursing homes and prison, yeah. those are the highest fatality rates. And I have such deep sympathy for people who have family members in prisons right now because there's no communication with them. Everything's shut down. I mean, talk about trauma. You know, you might have written a few bad checks and you're in prison for a couple of years and you might die there for it, right? Or you might be forced into a cell that's locked 24 hours a day and you that's your life for two years, right? So that, that's something I was thinking about because this next book 
I, is uh, basically a law book, you know, it, it's a legal, legal thriller. And my main character is a lawyer. And that looks really different right now. There's lots of Zooms. There's not, there's not that personal in-person sort of communication. There's the fear that even though it's supposed to be private, that the government's listening in. And, you know, so it, there's a lot of, of problems with that. And one of the big things is we have courtroom mon monitors in a lot of our courtrooms that are part of a nonprofit to track, okay, this, this particular judge, is he giving black people harsher sentences than white people? Is he, you know, is he being sexist toward the females? Is, you know, it, so those people can't be there anymore um, to keep track of what's going on inside courtrooms because it's, it's no longer something that is open to the public. So that, I'm, that's what I'm really thinking about as far as the book is talking about maybe what freedoms we're going to be losing because of COVID and whether or not we're going to get them back, right? Because well, it's a lot the, cheaper to, one of to those, Zoom. Uh, Yeah, one of the casualties in Australia has been the trial by jury, which is interesting. Yeah. Now, Debbie McInnes wants to know, are you a whiskey or a martini girl? Um, whiskey or, you know, I can uh, occasionally drink a martini. Whiskey tastes like uh, fire to me. Um, but I, I, I'm d a disappointing drinker. Usually I'm the one who orders like the really cool cocktail and I take a sip of it and then give it to a friend to drink the rest, <laughs> which is not, not good because I, I turned a friend into an alcoholic that way, I think. But it, I'm, I'm more of a mineral, sparkling mineral water person. Now, this is a cheeky question. And, and I know in giving the answer, you might have to give something away. So if you don't want to answer it, don't. How old are Sarah's greyhounds, Billy and Bob? Because they seem to be... <laughs> they they seem are to be 300 years old. I know the answer because I've read the book. So <laughs> I know what you've done here. But do you want to say? I will never, ever, ever hurt an animal. Ever, ever, ever. Uh, I, it just, I'll do a, anything to human beings and children. I, no problem, but not an animal. Um, actually, the hardest scene I wrote was about an animal that was fine, but it was hurt. Um, and that was in Pretty Girls. Uh, so, yeah, Sarah's greyhounds will live forever. So will Betty. Any animals they have are going to be perfectly fine. Um, there are always uh, writers watching uh, conversations like this, um, you know, with ambitions of their own. And one of the questions they often have is about structure. Um, in, in terms of your, your writing life. Um, Kerry is asking us, um, how do you structure your writing time? So do you have the discipline of writing a certain number of words each day for a set period? Or do you simply write whenever you feel like it? And there's another question as well, an earlier one with somebody who wants to know how long you sit with the story just in your mind before you start. Well, I'll start there. It depends on the story. You know, Pretty Girls was something that came to me very quickly and was very easy to write. And I mean, this book was very easy to write. I was so certain about what I wanted to do. I'd worked it out in my head for a couple of years. Um, so I just, you know, you know, this is a writer and the people out there probably know this is some, some books you feel more confident that you've got it all nailed down than you do in others. And, and, you know, in some ways that's good, but it's, not, I like a challenge too. So if, if it's a bit more complicated, I enjoy that. Um, but I do a lot of thinking in my head. This book, I think I was thinking about for four years before I wrote it. And I think about different books simultaneously. Um, so by the time I sit down, I'm very sure about what I want to do. And I, I don't write every day. I can't do that. I'm not disciplined enough. Um, but I do block out two weeks at a time and I go up to, I have a cabin in North Georgia in the mountains, um, which made it really difficult to write about women being attacked in the mountains. Um, but I go up for two weeks at a time. I wake <laughs> up in the morning, I write, I keep writing uh, and I, I stop when I'm tired and then I get up the next morning and start writing again. And I don't hold myself to a page count but I have an idea of what's, what chapters I want to get through because I think of them in, you know, every, every book should do this, right? It should be kind of a roller coaster. And so I want to get those done and down 
in e each time as I'm writing uh, up at the cabin in that two week period. So that's how I think about it. Now we have a question here about Slaughter Fest. Can you tell us what it is or what it was? Yeah, it was just a writer's convention and it was really fun. Um, you know, uh, a lot of my friends were in it and I thought uh, the one with Denise Mina was fascinating. And I, I love watching Linda LaPlante because you never know what she's gonna do, you know, what story she's gonna tell, if she's gonna pull out a knife or whatever. Um, she's just a great lady. Uh, and, you know, there was some, some really fantastic new authors, which I was really pleased. When we talked about what it, we wanted it to look like, you know, I've, I have made a, um, like a challenge to some friends of mine that whenever we do panels, we want to make sure there's at least one other woman on it and one, other, one person of color, right? So we want to make sure that we're being as inclusive as we can. And they, they were like totally on board with that. Let's, let's reach out to as many different people as we can. And we asked for volunteers, not just from my publishing house, but from other publishing houses because we didn't want it to feel insular or cliquish. And I wanted a good mixture of first time authors because there's so many fantastic new authors out there and being published right now, unless you're someone who's been published for 19 years is really difficult to, <laughs> to get any attention, whether it's COVID or politics or murder hornets or whatever, you know, nobody's really talking about books. Uh, on, on these uh, news programs or on the usual formats that talk about books. So, uh, you know, it was really important for me to have some fresh new authors on there. And we, ha we all had a great time, I think. I'd love to do it again next year. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens. Well, it's interesting to me that you, you said that because I know that um, at and so, one of the questions here, Anne has asked, that she's just binge watched an amazing series called Rectify, which I have not seen, but yes. she wonders whether you would like to see your books treated to us, in a, she says, in a reflective way, um, or do you prefer that they remain in print only, that the story is, a, is one in which we imagine what these people look like and how they sound? Well, I think I could have it both ways, because I always think of the books as my books. So if you want to know what I wrote, it's on the shelf, right? Because film and television are not really, uh, they're not even adaptations, they're interpretations of what the author wrote. And I, I found this out firsthand because Pieces of Her, which was a standalone novel I wrote, uh, is actually, the crew is quarantining right now as we speak in Australia <laughs> to start working on this for Netflix. And uh, a, a fellow Australian, Tony Collette, is going to be in it. Uh, so, uh, and she's yeah, already yeah. there, uh, and they're, they're ready to start filming, hopefully, uh, January, but they're all having to quarantine for two weeks in their hotel room. So that shows how devoted they are. Uh, but I read the, some of the, the scripts and, you know, they're different from the books, but I mean, the characters are still there. It's still a very rich story. I'm very pleased with what they've done. And I think if you don't want someone to change your stuff that you shouldn't option it. You know, it's kind yeah. of, it's kind of a, a bitch move to take the money and then complain. Cause you know, you're, you're letting someone else interpret your story. And I've, I, for years I've had people approach me about Grant County and I didn't like their ideas. And so I said, no. Um, but someone has actually very invested in, um, the Will Trent series in Grant County and hopefully doing something. So we'll see what happens. I don't have any big news about that. Um, but again, you know, you just have to trust the people you hand it to. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned Will Trent's because one of the questions that I was, uh, was asked to ask you here was whether or not you had any familiarity or what kind of familiarity you had with his background. And I don't, I don't know whether you want to answer that, but what, what do you say? Do you, well, the question is actually, do you have any personal experience? Well, no, I wasn't adopted that I know of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's something I'll find out on my dad. You need to video. give away what you want to give away. So don't give yeah. away too much. Yeah, so spoiler alert. Um, you know, I don't have it, but I do have a, like a place in the world where I know a lot of people who have had you know, horrible childhoods or, you know, come from adoption that was really fantastic and come from adoption that was really bad or grew up in the system or, 
you know, because I, I went to a public school. I didn't go to a private school. Um, and it was a really nice uh, public school, but I was with people who were different from me. Uh, and so it made me interested in their lives. And, uh, you know, I think the, the main goal with Will was to write someone who, and this, and this was the one personal thing, Will is dyslexic and that's something in my family. It's something that my sister has. And when we were in school, there was no such thing as special education or testing. And so her, her teachers just said she was lazy and not very smart. And I, that has framed her well into her adulthood. I mean, she's much older than me and she's, it's still something that she deals with. And she's not a stupid person. She's very clever. She's just not clever in the way that the system recognizes. And so I mm -hmm. wanted to write about someone with that issue who never had an advocate, who didn't, you know, have someone saying, no, he's not stupid. He's smart. We need to get to the bottom of this. We need to figure out what's wrong. Um, and, you know, that really has defined Will and the dealing with the trauma. That's why I know so much about the physical, um, physiological uh, ghosts that can haunt you if you are traumatized as a child. So, it, you know, I really did a deep dive into what Will's life would be like and talk to people from that background. Yeah. Now, one of, our, one of your readers wants you to know that, um, that she was very interested in your comments about diversity in the American police forces because she lives in the state of Western Australia, where there is a larger Indigenous population than there is um, elsewhere in the country, perhaps with the exception of the Northern Territory. Um, she lives in the outback, she says, about 1,700 kilometres east of Perth, which is really in the middle of nowhere. Um, there are two police officers, she says, of Indigenous background there, and they have patrolled the town for years. Um, and they and have maintained positive relationships with the young Indigenous people who live in the town. And she wanted you to know that it's been very successful. So I, bet I, I thought I'd pass yeah. that on. Now, I, I will have to never, ever, ever go see you there, but please come see me when I am in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> the, out, the outback is very beautiful, Karen. It's very beautiful. I hope you get it. And you can easily isolate yourself there. <laughs> well, blame Jane Harper because I read that book where the guy died in the sun, just yeah. from the sun. No, <laughs> no. It's your books and your films do not recommend ever going into the outback. That's right. She has that amazing scene where he's crawling around a grave. Yeah, like a sundial. Yeah. <laughs> trying to get the, into, fall into the shadow of it. I have to hand you back to Catherine. It's been fantastic to see you again. You're always yes, such a thoughtful, wonderful, uh, interesting, uh, full of character. The book is brilliant. It's thrilling, but it's also full of warm and loving relationships, as you say, and the development of the characters over a period of 20 years makes them feel like friends. It's been great to speak to you again, and I hope we get to see you in Australia before too long, Karen. Absolutely. I'm on the first plane when we can see you. Thank you, you Caroline. Great. Thanks so much, both um, Caroline and Karen. Look, anybody who says crime fiction is just like police stories just really needs to wake up because whenever I do one of these interviews, I just think the whole world is here. You're talking about so many things about all our lives. And that's, I mean, that was a particularly well-framed um, interview, Caroline, but there are just so many things about everything that we live through, um, which is fantastic. And you write good stories, well, both of you, but Karen writes fantastic stories. Now, if you haven't yet read The Silent Wife, um, you can go to our online bookseller, Dimmux. They've got a special page, just put in Bad Sydney and Dimmux, and you can get a copy of the book and of Karen's other books as well. So that was just the most interesting interview. Um, we'd like to be able to, and Karen, I haven't asked you this, so I'll, I'll ask you offline. Um, we'd love to put it up on our website so everybody who's interested in your work can have a look at it. Because it's um, it was just brilliant. I'll tell you very quickly now about our next event. It's tonight at 6 p.m. This time we go to the UK. We've been in America, we've been in Scandinavia, and now we're going to the UK with Nikki French, two for the price of one, as it were. Uh, two authors, a uh, 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 husband and wife couple. If you haven't yet got a ticket, you can get one from the Bad Sydney website. 
But now, please join me and we'll kind of do a virtual bit of applause for Karen and for Caroline and say goodbye. Karen, see you in Australia soon, I hope. Absolutely. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.